the stories about migration quite often are um, colored by our choice of words. And I have always been interested in words and their changing meanings in time. I'm now citing our next, next speaker, Merve Bedir. She's an architect, partner of Land and Civilization Compositions, curator and researcher. And she is looking at a broader uh, perspective. How can we live together? She has a PhD from Delft University of Technology. And she is part of a transnational women collective, Kitchen, in Gaz Gaziantep. Sorry, I stumbled on that. And she's also um, one of the founding uh, mothers of MAD. Um, MAD, and that's a center for spatial justice in Istanbul. And she will talk to us about the sociological and anthropological uh, perspective. And she will talk also about her own work, her own research uh, on urban changes and migration. What does hospitality actually mean? What does it mean to be a host um, and to be a guest? <coughs> so, Merve, the stage is all yours. That sounded very uh, big. <laughs> so I'll start somewhere and then I hope Pin will tell me to stop one minute before I should stop. And then wherever we are at that point, we are we stop there. Um, um, yeah, so the, uh, the way I started working on migration uh, in particular was actually 2012. Uh, I was looking at um, urban transformation in Istanbul uh, in several cities in Turkey and one of them being Istanbul and we were interested, I was working for the Netherlands Architecture Institute at the time uh, doing research on urban transformation and um, uh, also as a curator there. And uh, part of the research, part of the work was on the arrival neighborhoods because these, um, and arrival neighborhoods meaning uh, neighborhoods that are rich in infrastructure to host uh, or to facilitate migration. Um, and it's very interesting because these neighborhoods are um, very tightly connected to urban transformation processes. So the, if a neighborhood is uh, continuously transforming, changing in physical uh, terms, as a form, looking at it from an architectural designer perspective or planner's perspective, you also those neighborhoods are also those that have very strong infrastructure for migration. And Istanbul is certainly one of those cities that have um, had long histories of migration uh, through it. Um, so one of the things that was really striking for me was um, this language on well, I'll take one step back and put it uh, uh, in the story of narrative, in, in, the, in its narrative. Uh, 2012, we, we were working on the arrival neighborhoods in Istanbul in relation to urban transformation. And actually, it's around that time that the war in uh, Syria, the revolution in Syria happened and the war came out, the civil war came out. Um, and the arrival neighborhoods that we were researching in terms of urban transformation, have become those spaces that uh, have received a lot of migration from uh, Syria, uh, from different parts of Syria. Um, and also these different people were coming to different parts of the city. So it, it was really, um, uh, yeah, I mean, for the lack of a better word, interesting uh, phenomena just to observe uh, what was happening in the city. And of course, um, like every other nation state, Turkish state is was uh, proudly uh, talking about the open open door policy and the, the, the hospitality, both in terms of the language of the state and also in terms of the culture of the people. Uh, and this word hospitality was basically stuck in my head, like, um, what are we even talking about? Um, and, that, and at that point, well, the word hospitality in Turkish come, actually comes from Arabic, so I was trying to understand the word both from the English translation and from the Arabic translation, what it even means. 
Um, uh, and uh, you see on the left hand side also in relation to, this, to some of the words uh, that might relate to this evening uh, that relate to the notions of hospitality to the notion of hospitality and then on the right hand side you actually see the legal terms that connect to that relate to hospitality so for, if we look at the left hand side and also if we look at the quote from Derrida who is also a migrant from uh, Algeria in France who was um, I'll just quote this part this part from him uh, he Basically, in his book of hospitality, in his text of, of hospitality, he goes back to the roots of um, the word in Latin. And I'll just take read this part. Um, uh, host, guest, and their derivatives go back to the root hostis in Latin, meaning guest, stranger, and foreigner. The meaning of foreigner also includes that of enemy. The meaning of guest incorporates host or stranger with an implication of hospita hospitability and cure. The third meaning, hostage, reverses the meaning of hospitality included in host and defines it in, uh, from the receiver's position, the victims. The host is sometimes the hostage. Um, the word guest, uh, the, the host is sometimes the hostage. The word, the word guest comes from the same linguistic origin as the words host, ghost, hostile, hostage, hospitium, hospitality, and describes the varieties of relationships between the host and the guest. Um, the complexity inherent in this relationship includes several obligations and tensions, and here it comes back to my uh, work, my research, and um, or my collaborative work. Why is the guest at the door? Where did he come from? What's, it, what's its name? In fact, does it even have a name? And how important is it for us to know his name? What do, what do they want? Do I have to open the door? The answers to these questions determine the rules of hospitality. Uh, and if you look at the right-hand side, and actually maybe just at this point I should also say uh, what Derrida says. Um, he basically establishes a very strong connection between um, host, uh, the father, the nation state, the lord, the king, uh, and so on, uh, which is very important, I think, to understand several things that are wrong today. And also the, the, um, the, how he emphasizes the la language. Um, uh, the host uh, imposing the language on the guest is as the first act of violence. Um, and then if we go to the right-hand side now, this is, these, these are the terminology that I found in different uh, legal documents, uh, both in Turkey's and in uh, European Union, uh, uh, different uh, states and also the European Union law. I here took a couple of them. I, uh, the last time I found were 11 and then it was increasing. So these are the words that we use to group or the nation state uses to group the migrants. Applicant, conditional refugee, subsidiary refugee, temporary protect, protected, humanitarian residence permitted, victim of human trafficking, residence permit, so on and so forth. So basically the nation state, in order to be able to understand or to group or to label or to categorize or to include and exclude people, uh, has to create all these categories to, uh, has to create all these categories to basically deal with the entire situation. Um, and actually what you see these as these five words and <laughs> relates to the theme of the <laughs> evening as well. I actually tried to, as an architect this time, translate these words uh, that comes from the language to their spatial representations. So a shelter, a camp, a square, a stadium, a kitchen. Uh, and what's really important uh, is actually those words, that, that those questions that I listed. Uh, uh, what is the responsibility of the host to the guest? Uh, what is the responsibility of the guest to the host? Uh, and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, and this way, meaning the rules of hospitality. Uh, so coming to shelter. This, the, the, the moment of shelter is actually the first instant of how the host uh, reacts to the guest. So in this case, you see, for instance, this uh, Orin Hotel in Zagreb. It was an, uh, an empty, vacant hotel that became um, a temporary uh, stay for the, uh, for the migrants. Um, 
and it has, I think it is still in this condition, as far as I know. I know. Uh, the time that we went there, it was 2015. In, uh, in, it was one of the highest points uh, of um, uh, migration towards, let's say, Europe. Uh, another case, uh, this was supposed to be the Ritz Hotel in Bulgaria, uh, really close to Sofia, and then it's still, it was still called as the Ritz. The previous case, Orin Hotel, was managed by um, several volunteers, but also with the help of the NGOs there. Um, the Ritz was completely uh, used and created, let's say, as an architectural space, as an urban space, or as a space by um, migrants themselves who go from Turkey to, towards Bulgaria. Um, it, this is from Gaziantep. Uh, I don't know if you maybe heard of about uh, Roma people, um, the uh, nomadic people living in the Balkans mainly, but also in other parts of Europe. And then they're, let's say, the other branch of the, of the nomadic people, um, just like Roma people, is Dom people. They live mo mostly in the Middle East. Um, and they started actually moving around. I mean, they were living in the north of Syria, and they, but then they were nomadic anyway between Syria and Turkey. And, with the uh, 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 conflict with the, after the revolution, it became actually even more uh, mobile for them, let's say. But then in this case, the uh, people who were also migrating uh, joined, let's say, to this uh, nomadic movement, uh, movements of peoples. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, say here is to, is how, uh, to demonstrate how the, the the situation is actually co uh, in such complexity that ha that happens on the ground. <coughs> in this case, you see a picture from um, one of the arrival neighborhoods, actually the one that we were working at in 2012. And what I want to point, get your attention is actually the the languages that you see on the uh, on the plates uh, the, on the uh, buildings. Uh, this actually shows a kind of infrastructure that is not only physical for, let's say, movements of uh, people and goods and so on and so forth, but it's also um, uh, an infrastructure for representation. Uh, what you cannot read is actually you, you have uh, the branches of several NGOs uh, that are from these peoples who arrive in Istanbul in different points in time. So you see uh, um, an NGO from Kosovo people, for instance, that's, that relates to 1996 the Yugoslavian war, uh, the people from Kosovo who came to Istanbul set up an NGO in this neighborhood. So uh, when you look at the city uh, and when you try to under, it actually gives you a really good portrait of what's happening on the, on the ground, uh, also in terms of the migrations and the mobilities of the people. Um, we, I curated an exhibition in Istanbul um, as a continuation of the research, actually, it wasn't. It was not, nothing more than that. It wasn't that this particular decision made, but it it was kind of natural. Um, the exhibition was called Vocabulary of Hospitality, and one of the works by, was by Ülke Oktay, uh, and where she basically documented the neighborhood called Hasan Pasha on the Anatolian side of Istanbul. Uh, this neighborhood was very, very uh, is also very interesting to. Um, actually talk about, again, the complexity of the dynamics of what, what makes a city uh, and the narratives of the city, let's say, that relate to migration. Um, in this case, and again, how this, these narratives uh, cannot be separated from other narratives that relate to the uh, construction of the context, like what uh, Sahim was saying earlier, that we ca cannot just focus on one thing, it's actually the, the, the whole picture that creates uh, and facilitates or uh, sets an infrastructure to such a, to, to uh, different narratives of, uh, different narratives of the urban space, but uh, which also includes migration. Um, in the case of Hassan Pasha, what, what was happening was basically um, the large scale urban transformation that was supposed to happen there there was a big tender about the, the neighborhood. Um, the tender was won by a collaboration of several companies. And then the companies went bankrupt because the economy wasn't going so well anymore. And then the buildings stayed empty for a long time. They couldn't even pull down the buildings. But then what happened was like the people from 
uh, in this case, the Tur Turkmen uh, city, uh, the Turkmen towns in, in Syria, they started to come in and settle in these houses. Uh, and it was really the, you know, then the failure of the city and the state in a way kind of enabled a different kind of existence in the, within the city itself. Um, the state summer camp for uh, the, um, for the, uh, how do you say, the, the state railway structures, uh, civil servants, uh, the, a summer camp in Moda in Fenerbahce is super high-end and very uh, uh, popular neighborhood in Istanbul. Suddenly <coughs> was made into, well, in 2004, 2005, it was made into uh, a, a, a temporary refugee camp for uh, uh, migrants coming from Chechnya. Um, coming to 2015, they were evacuated, but actually nobody knew where they went. We, we looked for it, we couldn't find any, any information. But part of the narrative was actually related to the fact that 2012, the open door policy, the Syrian migration came into the city uh, and the state didn't really know how to deal with it anymore. So they kind of tried to figure it out altogether. So I guess the, this kind of relates to what I was telling in the beginning, in the, uh, at the very beginning about the categorization of migrants and how you try to deal with, the, uh, with this, um, um, uh, as the nation state, how, how you try to deal with the, so many different groups of people coming to the country. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not being very fair to the stories. I'll try to slow down and skip some of the slides so that I, I, I'm more fair to the story. So this one, maybe I will, I will go very fast because it came up before. Uh, not immediately, but uh, as an example. Uh, so the, uh, the case of Calais, how on the left hand side you see the jungle and how on the right hand side you see the, the uh, formal container camp uh, established by the state. But what, was, what is interesting here and what I want to emphasize is that the right, the right hand side camp uh, is, uh, was run by uh, the Logistic Solutions, a company um, that also runs the military services in Egypt and who was basically managing this camp for the state in, uh, in Kale. And the camp plan, I'm skipping very fast. Well, you, the, the button <coughs> images you saw actually on the, the, the top, uh, the Grand the, ca the case from Dunkirk that Emma was talking about, and then the top is the container camp. Uh, in Calais, for me, there is, well, the difference is, of course, that the top image is, uh, the camp you see is, uh, I mean, whether you put people in it or uh, water in the container, I guess it doesn't make a difference. In the, from the point of view of the manager. Uh, and on the bottom, you actually have like the, the uh, Doctors Without Borders setting up the camp um, together with several other volunteers and uh, NGOs uh, in Grand Center. Uh, case of Lesbos, I'll go very fast. Um, I'm not going to get into this. I was planning to talk a little bit about the technologies that relate to migration narratives. Um, this one is from Turkey, from uh, Gaziantep, Kilis, uh, I should say, another city that's close to Gaziantep. Uh, a tent camp and a container camp next to each other, uh, the, with a Turkish flagpole in the middle and the social centers and the education facilities where the uh, children who are born in the camp and who, came, who come to, to uh, Turkish side are educated with the, uh, with the curriculum. Um, and also maybe the security road, the buffer zone, and then the security tower. So how the camp actually becomes a kind, a kind of conf space of confinement. Uh, and the, the notion of diaspora, which I mean, the, 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 the guy you see on the left is the manager of the camp, but what you see above his head, uh, the antenna and the satellite dish, I mean, the representation of the, of the, uh, of the diaspora and the culture outside. Uh, and another reading of technology, maybe. Um, I'll go very fast. Well, yeah. Um, maybe we can come back to these when we are in discussion. Um, this one was, again, in the exhibition, but it was something that 
uh, I did together with Alican in uh, an architect from Istanbul. We actually simulated we, we made a simulation model of the detention center in Istanbul from the inside because it's rather impossible to have any news about uh, about the detention center itself. This work was done in 2014. Uh, and it was started to, I mean, it got included in the curriculum of the law school, uh, of two law schools in Istanbul, and was started to be used by the NGOs uh, to support court cases. Uh, so, um, I guess the, I guess what, what needs to be said here is, is again in relation to narratives and migration, but also in relation to the, uh, since we have so many of us as architects or designers in this room, how. Um, the, the, the boundaries and the limits of the profession actually could get expanded. So I would, uh, yeah, I mean, that's also something that could uh, maybe be brought up in discussion. Uh, the square, uh, the square in the meaning of public space, the square in the meaning of visibility, the square in the meaning of confrontation and coincidence and uh, uh, the possibility of uh, getting to know the other. And maybe one thing that, uh, that again could be related to several other countries in Europe. How, I mean, is there actually, a, are there actually squares for everyone or is the square for everyone and what do we mean with, with the public and so on and so forth. In this case, again, it was for the exhibition but, for the, for, uh, but made in public space. Um, the four artists came together and they uh, found out about the names that the migrants use for in Istanbul for the names of the streets. So uh, and they put them on the on the plates and hung them on on the streets and squares themselves. So this uh, square just in front of Galatasaray High School in Sky Street is actually called by Syrian migrants uh, as the Pole Square. So they put it up um, to make this language and this, uh, the other daily life visible in the city. Another example, the Mil Mindele, it's a Congolese migrants. In French, apparently it means uh, a thousand white faces. So the, the way that Congolese migrants see the most famous street on, on, in Istanbul, and nobody would know uh, otherwise. Another example of that, um, this is something we did in Amsterdam, but I'm going to skip this one. Uh, the stadium. Uh, a narrative on, on in, its, uh, in itself, uh, and also relates to the, to the words that I was trying to come up with in relation to hospitality and uh, migration. Um, this film is uh, it's a two-channel video installation you are seeing only one of them right now. Uh, it was again made for the exhibition. Uh, it's called Stadium. Uh, this channel is uh, in uh, pitch. So um, and the, the story is, is about the African Football League in Istanbul. Um, for, for more than a decade now there's, a, there's an African football league in Istanbul that's played with more than 10 teams that come from different countries from Africa. So, the, so there's such a potential of migration in Istanbul that the, there's even a possibility to, to, set up, um, uh, to set up a football league. Uh, you can't hear the uh, voices but uh, uh, what happened was basically the, I mean the, the league, uh, the um, mayor of the uh, neighborhood of this district basically allows this uh, stadium to be used by the African Football League. And African Football League is basically a bunch of people, a bunch of uh, migrants from different countries from <coughs> Africa wanting to play football once, uh, once per, uh, per week. Um, and uh, what happens in the end is that the league gets so famous that, the, uh, that managers from Turkish National Football League start to go there to watch the games. And when we visit, when we went there to for uh, doing the first checks, let's say for the for the exhibition and for the for the work itself, what we actually saw was that the people who are the, I mean the actual supporters from different again different uh, countries from Africa, uh, they were uh, in the uh, in the audience, and then the Turkish people, the locals, let's say, or the Istanbulites, they would watch. They would also watch the uh, watch the. Uh, games, but they would watch it from the tea house on the upper on the upper level. So they wouldn't necessarily get, come together. So this story I would relate later on to to the possibility of living together. That's why I'm telling in this detail. 
Um, and then in the end, the, uh, when the National Football League uh, managers uh, really liked some of the players, they actually wanted to transfer them, but there was a huge issue because they didn't have even residence permit. They were undocumented, so they had to be legalized. So then this uh, African Football League suddenly became an NGO and they started to uh, provide residence permit and work permit for the players uh, playing in the, in the league. And this became uh, an industry, a sector in itself, maybe too big of a word, but it, it is what it is. Um, and for me, that's like a space of hospitality, in this case, the stadium. Uh, the kitchen, I will be talking in this case about our, our own work. Well, the, the thing, what I need to say, including my own story, is that uh, uh, Antep was one of the places where I met a lot of women. Uh, and over four or five years of time. So it's not just uh, one visit or, or uh, a certain moment. Um, and they, they, I mean, they, they were already doing several things and uh, meeting, gathering, so on and so forth. And we had to... Uh, take it further. So it was a common decision made by everyone. So we decided to call. Them. We decided to set up this kitchen, but the kitchen uh, where we cook all together. One of our interests was also the changing food culture in the city. So uh, we said, like, let's start with that. But we also do other things. Um, and what we did were, I'm going to skip these. Uh, we started organizing different events, uh, activities, gatherings, uh, also like workshops. I mean, this one is about music in the city, but we also organized uh, self-defense workshops. Uh, we also organized um, uh, the, the uh, seminars about justice and equity and, and women's rights in Turkish law and uh, so on and so forth. So really trying to, you know, um, uh, create the space all together and be in solidarity and that's maybe the one word that can, that I leave to the end, the kitchen as a representation of solidarity in the, voca in the vocabulary of, in the dictionary of, uh, in the dictionary of hospitality and migration. Um, yeah, I, I guess I can just conclude here. I don't know how much I'm far, I have, uh, how far I am. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, one thing that I would uh, emphasize is Maybe the, solidar the moment of solidarity is where the notion of hospitality is dissolved because there is no host or guest anymore or the guest is also the host. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Merve. Um, if you'd like to join me uh, here, you have a microphone here as well. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you also for your last... Um, conclusion that the difference between guest and host dissolves when there is solidarity. Um, just, uh, I haven't been really following the news today, but of course the American midterms are happening at the moment. Um, does anybody actually, is there already something known, something in the news about it? After midnight, okay, good to know, good to know. Um, no, why, why I bring this up is because um, it is, of course, also about language. Yeah? Like you already said, there, there we use language um, to define, for example, what a refugee is. And I just thought like, one thing that was very important, I think, also in, this, um, uh, in the United States um, for this midterm election was the term migrant caravan, something that I heard over and over again. Um, how do you look on that, like, for example, in this, in this language discourse where the term migrant caravan is used or misused um, in a quite a right-wing rhetoric? How do, you see, how do you see that? Yeah, I mean, in general, the, the way we use words are actually the framing of the argument and also the way our perceptions are tried to be manipulated, I guess that's the way I put it, but uh, I should put it, but I mean, the reality or the truth, uh, I mean, it's just, it's one, it's not many, so... Um, How do you mean? It's, um... I mean, the, the, uh, there are hundreds of people walking to the US border, so... Um, this caravan is just one, let's say, of, it's one, one case 
it is put into such words to um, to um, create a certain perception about it. I mean, it's a bit like maybe a more radical or drastic example would be. I I love giving this example because it immediately dem demonstrates actually the, the word climate change, for instance, how we use that. Um, we don't call it climate crisis, but mm -hmm. we call it migrant crisis, but we don't call climate cha change climate crisis, but we should actually, because there's if we need to do something about something, it's the climate crisis. Yes. You know, so, th I mean, that that's in a way the... Um, um, I guess we could look at migrant caravan in a similar way. Yes, to analyze how why how it is used and actually to uh, raise feelings of fear and anxiety for a certain group who benefits from that politically. Um, yes, is there actually an increase of this kind of um, use of words in a negative way? Because you said there are so many terms for. Um, well, synonyms for refugees, migrants, etc. Do you feel there is a, a shift in, in language there? Um, yeah, I mean, Zygmunt Bauman talks about this in Liquid Modernity, and well, talked about it in Liquid Modernity, how, um, the, uh, how fear was basically um, accelerated and exaggerated with the use of um, um, with the related rhetoric and then how how fear relates to encampment and then how, well, creating of camps. I'm getting into too many theory, theory right now, but yeah. how basically with fear and fear we feed into xenophobia and how we create our walls, our own walls ourselves. It also with starts, this fear. And, that's, and languages that plays a major part in it. Exactly. Would Changing language be a part of a solution? Well, it's a representation of the of the of the issue. I'm not Is sure. Is it naive to think that change of language would? Um, well, the thing help? is, the problem. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that um, I'm at least for me personally, I'm not necessarily looking for solutions, but I'm trying to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. When you ask the right questions, then you can then your answers or your response might be small, but it is targeted. Um, that's at least what I'm trying to do. I mean, that's why I started reading law as an architect working on the, on, on, uh, to, in, to, on the topic related to, to migration. Yes, because um, also like Emma said, for example, um, once you start digging into it, I think it becomes more and more complex. Yeah. Um, and I think being a curator, uh, for example, must be quite, yes, quite challenging as well. To, um, what is for you, um, what is for you the major challenge when you work around migration? What are what are your own? Um, what do you feel that is very sensitive, or that you, yeah, that you need to be sensitive about? Um, where are you careful? Um, well. There are several things that I have learned. I wouldn't necessarily give this as a formula to what, to how to do something, but uh, some of the things that I learned was definitely, for instance, to take a step back and to really learn to listen and then to manage to facilitate rather than dictate, um, um, or uh, uh, or uh, to try to create the possibility for uh, speaking for yourself, I mean, for, for the people who are in the group mm -hmm. uh, at that moment. Uh, so, merely learning these and trying to uh, apply it in your behavior is a challenge on its own. Mm -hmm. um, also, it, it, has, it doesn't really relate to the nature of architecture or the nature of architectural education, at least. So, you really need to learn to facilitate uh, and to curate in that sense may, may be an interesting word. Yes, and because how do you um, tell stories? That's actually the main theme uh, of tonight. Um, I think an issue for uh, white Western storytellers, uh, like me, for example, would be um, how do I carefully and in a non-colonial way um, try telling stories that are maybe not my own? Um, 
I would say I'm looking at you for a solution there. Um, but is it just something we are not allowed to do? Or is there some way that we can do it? Or should we facilitate? How do you, how do you see that? Well, in the case of, I mean, I guess may, maybe one thing that I could say is most of my work on the ground, uh, in the field, let's say, for the lack of a better word, is in Turkey, where I'm from and where I was raised. Um, most of my research, on the other hand, is actually more in European context. Uh, so that's one thing that I need to put for put down first. And then the second is, um, in relation to this, uh, what I could say is, at least in relation to the Turkish context, or the context in Turkey, uh, is that, uh, first of all, um, uh, Telling stories in a colonial way is a difficult because we are all in in we are all part of it. So that's also a longer discussion. So maybe I skip that part first, mm -hmm. uh, and then it's I for say the eight at night, I guess. <laughs> like exactly. Yeah. Um, but what I would say is to first of all, um, the stories that I tell are also my stories. So it, in that sense, I'm not necessarily telling other people's stories. You're included in I'm it as well. I'm included in mm -hmm. the story, in the story, for better or for worse. So that's one. And then the second is, and this I really would like to emphasize, and also emphasize as a problem in in the in the northern European context, is that um, what we did maybe the as the best thing was to find the common uh, story. Uh, so the common issue that was um, um, uh, among the migrant. Uh, women in the case of Gaziantep, for instance, or uh, Istanbul, elsewhere, um, the issues were shared between, let's say, again, for the lack of a word, but better word, um, between the Syrian society and the Turkish society, between different peoples. So the one for issues example, are... What kind of issues were they? Well, shelter, education, health, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, labor um, being undocumented, um, uh, all the speculation around migration, so on and so forth. So if you if you find the common common issues, then that's really actually it really brings you together. Mm -hmm. uh, so then there is no say, uh, there is no uh, this or that us or them anymore because there is the the ground for solidarity or doing something together. Um, and th this I find, for instance, difficult to happen in, in, in Europe or, I mean, in Rotterdam, for instance, where I used to live, um, because there's a very structural uh, segregation issue that the two societies, they don't even know each other and they don't even want to know each other. So, I, I mean, it's my very cynical observation by now, but uh, th this is also why like, my, I have doubts about living, how to live together. Uh, maybe we cut this part from the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but yeah, so many interesting subjects to talk to touch on. But maybe something a little bit more about um, a side of yourself um, is that you uh, describe yourself as a nomad, if I'm right. I used to. Yeah, I'm you trying used not to. to. Oh, okay. <laughs> why? Why did you? And why don't you anymore? I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> Traveling, you mean? <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, I was trying to work between the Netherlands okay, and Turkey. Okay, I, I thought it was an, uh, I thought it was a specific standpoint of calling yourself a nomad. And, uh, it relates, but I mean, it, of course, it relates. But I mean, the the thing is, the um, uh, I think there's a the, there's an important uh, overlap among all the stories, all the um, uh, the not being able to settle in this world, um, and there's. There's a lecture in Goldsmiths, uh, Michel Ferrar, he talks about the neoliberal system, but again, it's a, maybe another A's at night. Uh, All these ideas for the coming season. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, he basically talks about how the state uh, today is in transformation. And that state, uh, while enables some people to be mobile and uh, be the the be in the life uh, style that everyone supposedly looks up to, some people are uh, how they are not allowed those roots of mobility mm -hmm. um, and the, the complicity in this in these two scenarios. Yes. So I guess I'm kind of nomad, nomadic in one way and trying to relate to the other side. I would love to invite uh, Sahim and Emma.
for, um, let's see, our last questions of tonight. Um, and then, as a closure, we will go to Bide. So, um, Sahim, have you heard um, anything tonight, maybe from Emma, maybe from Merve, that um, inspired you, made you think about your work, uh, you could relate to, or you think totally different about? I think we have uh, all of us. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, uh, I think for most of the people there are very proud of Europe as a continent because we have a very multicultural place. It's uh, one of the most beautiful places on earth. For example, I have been to China a lot of times. There you have only see Chinese in Japan, you only see Japanese, but here you, you can see everybody. And I think in our uh, workshops, all three of us, it was clear who more you know these people, who more respect you show for them, and who you sympathy you get from them. And I think that's what, what we needed uh, in the future also, because that's the only uh, solution for our problems. So to know each other more, and to you'll have more respect from both sides. For example, what I see in CatNet, because I have three kids, I always watch CatNet, what they are doing, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good, because they have always bring other people to, kids to speak about their idea and interviews them, that from the basic school or from, that they will know each other. These people, they are like you, they are like human, and they, what you have, they have the same. So I think it's really uh, nice what they are doing. Yes, so there is an effort to tell different stories, to um, even on Ketnet. Um, it's really good. Emma, um, yeah, how do you look back on tonight? Um, have you heard anything that inspired you, maybe for the future um, of your project? Yeah, of course, I think it was really interesting to especially see two different points of um, how to tell a story and how to um, what do you say or what do you not say and what do you want that people remember in a kind of way and I think like it's really um, comes more about like the common ground like how do you tell a story that people can relate to not really on the migration but more like a love story like your film and like you like how do you present yourself to somebody else and hospitality it's like um, yeah, try to not find the difference, but really like the dialogue and how you can start to talk to people. And I think that is the only way we can uh, build a future together, like here. Thank you. Maybe we'll have a look at Wiede. <laughs> Wiede Frost. So, yeah, uh, I only have uh, the ones of Merle, Merv, Merve, uh, Stock, so zero emission migra migration <laughs> could be uh, uh, like the idea of the football starting <coughs> careers or conversations, <coughs> the solidarity kitchen with the leather soup, the square with people forced to be together, interacting. I, I, something I recognize from living in Brussels also that you share the space. Uh, whether you want it or not, and it's a great a way to start a dialogue. The antenna basketball field. Okay, yeah, Somebody playing God. Occupied space, space unoccupied space. It's, it says it all. The, the idea of the host being the guest or the guest being host, and, and uh, the, I th think that's a nice concept too, because who chooses? And uh, the shelter from human beings. Uh, thank you. No, thank you. Um, so I want to um, ask if there's maybe, I think we maybe have time for one last question from the audience. One, it says Pina. Yes. Hey, uh, excuse me. Uh, can I ask uh, for Sahim? Yes. For Sahim. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Now, uh, as a, a filmmaker or a scenarist, if you want to make a concept or idea for your film, do you prefer to make it directly or like making very deep or projection to uh, explain your idea? 
I'm not sure if I understand, I understand the question. So can you, can you repeat the question again? So uh, do you mean... Sometimes we have to uh, explain our idea in our films directly by making characters uh, in a real life story and the other side we can make it like a, we can make the audience think more um, by using metaphors you mean or uh, yeah. right? uh, I mean we can make it indirectly mm -hmm. to explain our idea to make the audience think more I think and your question is what is Sahim's preference uh, direct or indirect uh, yes uh, what does he prefer? Yeah. Okay, I would like to answer your question. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's the power of the cinema is that you, you, you see more than in, in your daily life. And that's the reason that cinema got so huge power. For me, it's always interesting uh, just to focus in, in the main character and to make it more exotic and to make it more unique. Because in the cinema, it's not important what you tell, it's important how you tell your story and how you, do you, you, you use your own signature to tell your story. So for me, for example, Zagros, that's the way I told uh, you that we didn't like to tell a problem about refugee, but to make it more universal, for example, that the people in Canada or Australia or China understand the story and also the main character, their motivation and for example, if you put everything apart, the culture and tradition, even without that, you can follow the main character and the story. But just as you put all the things in the political background and other things, just to make it more uh, realistic and also more actual. That's the way things about the story. But always, I use local things to make the movie more interesting for the people also. If, you, for example, a lot of people, uh, they were afraid that we, why we use guerrilla fighters in the movie, or why we use the political background of it. But I think it helps the audience to understand the situation. Also, if you go to watch a movie, for example, from Iran, you are very curious to know how the, they love their uh, the political situation, the society, and it uh, attracts people more to the m movie. So if you use that, Try to use also your own uh, yeah, culture, background, and tradition in the movie. But it doesn't mean that I will never make a movie about the Flemish uh, of Belgian society. So that's also one of my next steps. Yeah. Yes. So um, thank you so much to all my guests here around me. Emma Ribbens, um, Merve Bedir, Sahim Omar Khalifa. I practiced on that the whole evening. Thank you so much. <laughs> that last thing was good. Thank, that was better, yes, yeah, see, relation. Um, and of course, Wiede Verknokke, and uh, thank you so much for the audience that you were here for this AZ night. Um, and also, thank you to the partners at 33, Architectuurwijzer, PXL, Med School Arts, Lucas School of Arts, Campus Seamine, and U Hasselt Faculteit van Architectuur en Kunst. Uh, thank you all for making this evening possible. And good to know, of course, Willem Kissenbeek and Loosje Delahe are uh, here tonight as well making um, in the cafe downstairs an, an essay uh, that you can take with you and there is a riso printer and you can uh, get one while you are at the bar or waiting at the bar and of course if you have questions for guests tonight you can of course talk to them at the bar downstairs so yeah and everybody gets a bonneke for two euros i guess so a voucher a voucher thank you so much and of course josephine van beek is present here as well uh, she will, like, <laughs> she will um, write about tonight, and um, her text will be, uh, uh, well, will be, how do you say it? Oh no. You can read her text on the Facebook uh, site or the Z33 research website. And of course, this was the last AZ night of tonight, and um, we, yeah, we will we'll look back on four quite nice uh, nights on climate change, on uh, well, art, of course, artistic practice on the chances of the periphery. On um, yeah, and of, we talked about the future of work, and we talked about migration. It was, uh, I think, quite a lot to talk about in these last four evenings. So thank you so much, and I hope to see you back here at the new AZ Nights. Thank you so much. Thank you.